Hello, this is Ann Jones, Webcast Manager at Premia, and I am pleased to welcome you to this Premia webinar. Today, Alan D. Grody will present Risk Aggregation and Risk Reporting, New Requirements Set the Pace for Accelerated Training. Alan Grody is a leading practitioner, academic, and advisory advisor working at the forefront and intersection of risk management and risk data, risk, or data management. He is the founder of Financial Intergroup Holdings, LTD, a strategic consulting and financial industry joint venture development company. Alan has been involved in the financial industry for his entire business career of nearly five decades. He has had hands-on experience in multiple sectors of the financial industry and has been consulting domestically and internationally on issues related to financial institutions, global strategies, capital and contra contract marketing restructuring, industry-wide financial business reengineering, information systems, evolving communications infrastructures, and risk management methods and systems. Alan is currently a founding board member of the Journal of Risk Management in Financial Institutions. Please feel free to submit your questions to the presenter via the question pane on the right-hand side of your screen at any time during the presentation. Audience questions will be moderated by Premia's exam director, Andy Kondorake, and answered by Alan at the end of the session as time allows. So now, Alan, I will turn the presentation over to you. Um, good morning. Thank you all for uh, being here. Um, I think we've got some very interesting uh, news to make. Uh, to inform you of um, a very exciting uh, first step on uh, the route to risk adjusting the financial system. Um, risk measurement has been part of the regulatory agenda in financial services since the first Basel Capital Court was introduced in 1988. We all assumed that the discipline developed to report on regulatory capital through the Basel lens would embed a risk culture and engender a thoughtful understanding of risk appetite in financial firms. However, these ambitions have remained largely unfulfilled, due in part to an inability to maintain the quality of data needed, and in part to the inability to aggregate that data for meaningful risk analysis and reporting. Uh, our work, which will, I will discuss later, introduces a bridge between the direct uh, alignment of financial performance metrics and risk exposure metrics. This enables the risk appetite setting process to be metricized and become an integral part of the financial planning and budgeting cycle. Such risk exposure metrics can also be used to compute risk adjusted returns on capital and further to risk adjust the betas in the capital asset pricing model, thus bridging economic theory with risk management concepts. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, go to our presentation. We have uh, just endured a financial crisis of epic, epic proportions, one that almost toppled the entire global economy. We are still not finished with it. Europe and Asia remains, let us say, troubled. Assuming we get out of it for now, we still have to deal with another problem, a crisis of confidence. Regulators and investors don't trust the risk information they get from the financial community. Just a few days ago, it was reported by Reuters that regulatory action may be needed to end variation in the way banks add up risks they take. Further, the article said that the Basel Committee is now studying risk weightings in the banking book and quoted the Basel Committee as saying, uh, quote, it was reasonable for investors to complain that current risk disclosures are opaque. And further, that remedies could include a combination of better disclosures, stricter supervision, and forcing banks to show risk calculations based not only on their own, but a standard model. This is our problem to fix, our industry's problem to fix. If we leave it to the regulators and legislators, the result will be a political solution which always gravitates to the lowest common denominator and in the end winds up not solving the problem. Look at what we have to show for it. A dysfunctional risk regime, a patchwork of capital and contract market infrastructure that is springing leaks daily, perhaps with another disastrous flash crash looming. Uh, our financial institutions are being asked to write their death wishes in their living wills. 
a serious set of unintended consequences from attempting to move OTC derivative markets into the futures industry infrastructure is with us at this very moment. And finally, a first attempt at a global identification system for financial market participants and the products they own, trade, and process, that too is potentially compromised through common denominator politics and contention amongst industry constituents. This system, a uh, sort of barcode for banking, as it is sometimes thought of, is allowing us to think about the quality of data issues we live with every day, the ability to aggregate this data, and how to fix our risk data problem. The next, how do we fix our risk data problem? There are two initiatives that are on the regulators' tables today that I wish to tell you about in today's webinar. They are both intended to work together. The first one is the Global Legal Entity Identifier, the LEI initiative, a first step toward risk adjusting the financial system. It starts with a global identification system for financial market participants to allow for aggregating counterparty risk exposures and systemic risk analysis. It is like a social security number or a tax ID number. It is the first component of the G20's mandated global identification standard. In this webinar, we will focus on the status of that implementation. The second initiative is the Exposure Measurement and Aggregation Initiative for internal risk data around implementing Basel's recently released Principles for Effective Risk Data Aggregation and Risk Reporting. Here, the prescription for change is around exposure measurement that must be dynamic, comparable, and tied to a firm's books and records. That is, it must be reconcilable to the firm's general ledger. It is an attempt to get control over the stochastic techniques, far and the like, that are deemed overly complex, non-additive, uh, that has inconsistent modeling techniques and assumptions, and that is now being challenged by regulators as the basis for determining capital buffer. In this webinar, we will also focus on examination of risk exposure uh, quantification alternatives. Next, uh, I'd like to talk about the financial crisis in the modern era. In my telling the history of the modern era of financial crisis, I'd like to begin with the salad oil scandal of the 1960s that put one of the biggest commodity and securities firms under, Ira Hopton Company, and almost cratered American Express, yes, American Express, who was then providing financing to what turned out to be a criminal enterprise. We moved through the paper crisis of Wall Street that caused the securities business to close down one day each week to handle the paper deluge of that era, the currency crisis, the Hearst bank failure in Germany that made us all sensitive to overnight global systemic risk, the currency crisis, the energy crisis, the Wall Street crash of 1987, the long-term capital fiasco, pension and tax reform, and the flash crash. Along the way, we built infrastructure institutions for multilateral novation of financial transactions and for clearance, payment, and settlement of those transactions and warehouses for immobilizing securities, all to create a risk-adjusted financial system. We changed our manual process to a highly automated financial system that is, by most accounts, seriously problematic and fraught with data quality issues and a dysfunctional identification system that requires huge mapping tables to cross-reference all the proprietary codes that purport to represent the same product or client. Most egregiously, we put in place progressive Babel, Babel risk regimes that failed us all. Next, the Basel Accords. It is understood that fundamentally a firm's risk management regime is comprised of setting of its risk appetite, determining its capital requirements, and pricing risk inherent in its financial products. It is also expected that the risk management
management regime must be derived from a common risk measurement framework. However, uh, it is widely understood that the absence of a standardized, dynamic, aggregatable, and replicatable risk measurement framework results in the inability of banks to set and monitor their risk appetite, appetite using any objective measures and for investors and regulators, most importantly, to determine whether a firm is taking on too much risk absolutely or in comparison to others. Overall, uh, of the, uh, in all the Basel regimes, the Basel capital requirements has remained fixed at 8% of risk-weighted assets, although that 8% has increased in, the, let's say, purity as the calculations of risk-weighted assets became more refined, and the definitions of capital and qualifying reserves became more precise. It has uh, constantly, constantly been tampered with in an incremental way. Now questions of its veracity is being put forward by none other than its creator, the Basel Committee. We will talk to the significant shift in attitude at the Basel level a bit later in this presentation. Next, I want to talk about the Dodd-Frank agency agenda, which is broad, as you can see here in this slide. The Dodd-Frank legislation represents U.S. regulators' attempts at fundamental change, keeping to the themes of data and data aggregation. I uh, would focus the Dodd-Frank legislation discussion uh, today on the U.S. Treasury and its Office of Financial Research focus on data seeing the LEI, the Legal Entity Identifier, as the universal standard in order to observe systemic risk. The SEC sees it more broadly as a common set of both product and financial market participant identifiers, usual for market surveillance and most recently its computer audit trail project. The CFTC needs the Legal Entity Identifier to oversee the over-the-counter derivatives markets that have come under their purview. And the Federal Reserve, uh, FINRA, and other agencies are hoping to gain consensus of an identification system that would be cooperatively administered in some public-private configuration be used by industry and regulators, and that will ultimately replace all proprietary identification schemes. But obstacles remain, as I am sure you can appreciate, given we have known about this problem for nearly three decades, and many standard bodies in our industry have tried and failed to come up with an agreed to standard. Divulging business information of their business hierarchies and their ownership relationships of companies is but one issue. Having standards bodies that compete with each other now working together to come up with a new standard is yet another. Uh, next, the G20's uh, Financial Stability Board's agenda. It appears that U.S. regulators and so sovereign regulators are realizing that global standards need global oversight. Finally, the issue has been taken up by the Financial Stability Board, a creation of the G20 that has been given the mandate to oversee on a global basis the contagion of systemic risk. Tying the LEI and a system of global identification of financial market participants and the financial products they trade to observing systemic risk has not been easy. It's only recently that the right global institution, the Regulatory Oversight Council, what we call the ROC, ROC, has been empowered to take on the challenge of getting global identification standards defined and accepted by sovereign regulators. In their recent summary, the G20 set a data and risk management agenda. The G20 and its Financial Stability Board and now the ROC have become the de facto center of the universe for dealing with financial reform to set a way forward in recognizing the contagion of systemic risk building up in the global financial system, and finally, to attempt to mitigate a financial crisis from occurring again at all tall order. The basis of this program focuses on the global financial institutions, the capital they are uh, to hold, the risk they take on in trading derivatives, 
and the incentives they receive for selling complexity and perhaps a bit of obfuscation. The agenda includes setting financial institutions to fail through an orderly disassembly based on living wills, increasing capital, regulating all manner of derivatives, adding exchange-based trading and central clearing to the remaining principal derivative products now traded bilaterally, working to resolve high-frequency trading, and rethinking our dysfunctional identification system of financial market participants and the products they trade. This is all on their agenda. Next, we're going to talk about the Financial Stability Board. The Financial Stability Board was established in April 2009 under the G20 to coordinate at the international level the work of national financial authorities and international standard setting bodies. Uh, they were set up to develop and promote the implementation of effective regulatory, supervisor, supervisory, and other financial sector policies and to bring together national authorities responsible for financial stability. It is chaired by Mark Carney, Governor of the Bank of Canada and soon to be Governor of the Bank of England. Its secretariat is located in Basel and is hosted by none other than the Bank for International Settlement. Next, I'd like to talk to you about the Global LEI Initiative and where we are on its implementation. Let me give you a current status on this most important first step toward risk adjusting the financial system and where it originated from. Next, I'd like to speak to you about Lehman's revelation, where it all began. The uh, current regime of regulatory reform, reform and specifically the Dodd-Frank Act was inspired by the revelation of what was found in the basement of the wreckage of the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy. No consistency in identifying Lehman as a counterparty with others, no understanding of what relationships Lehman had with others, no mechanism to associate all of Lehman's products and businesses into a told view of the exposures other, others had to Lehman should it fail. In effect, no one, not regulators or creditors or counterparties, could see into Lehman's exposure to risk. Next, the big fix. This absence of a unique, unambiguous, and universal legal entity identifier has led to individual firms' need for a layer of mapping software and middleware to compensate for this fundamental missing piece of the infrastructure of the industry. The consequences are enormous, huge additional costs, and a process one can only describe as mapping hell. Looking into the basement of Lehman, the regulators, the forensic accountants, the bankruptcy lawyers, the creditors, and the counterparties found the plumbing leaking at best and in need of replacement for sure. And the, as the problem, as we all know it, wasn't just Lehman. It was a fundamental flaw in the infrastructure of the global financial industry. No universal identification of business entities that we loan money to, extend credit to, use as reference entities in our credit default swaps, and trade with as counterparties. Uh, next, I'd like to talk to you about uh, some of the requirements of the global legal entity identifier. Here are uh, the key requirements of the proposed global identification system. That is the LEI standard advocated by regulators and industry members alike. It has to be self-registered, which means having the financial market participant identify itself. Who else knows it better than the firm that sets up the articles of incorporation or applies for a broker dealer license or a bank charter? The number itself needs to have no intelligence in it. No intelligence in it, no country or issuing agency code, no ability to parse the numbers to determine meaning. Instead, all intelligence is contained in the associated reference data. Change the reference data, not the number, and the number can persist for all times, providing a meaningful audit trail for any and all changes that occur. Certification is, of course, sort of a sticky wicket. We advocate for auditors as designated certifying agents, 
Uh, perhaps exchanges. In reality, auditors and exchanges are already at the front lines in observing the creation of legal entities. Others believe the certifying function can be carried out by central security depositories or clearing agents or data, data vendors. This LEI system is to be organized as a federated network of individual country-specific LEI registries brought together as a virtual database much as the Internet and the World Wide Web work today. It will start up in 2013, that's now, with a final launch date decision to be taken by a newly installed board of directors that will be overseen by the Regulatory Oversight Council. The board nomination process is to begin shortly. Now let's drill down into the LER requirements. Uh, I'd like next to talk about the common identifier system that we are proposing. Our approach to the legal entity identifier is for the component parts known as the entity specific portion of the code uh, to have a sovereign sponsor uh, that is a government of sorts or a regulator in a sovereign country uh, sponsor a local operating unit which will have the discretion as to what to use for this portion of the code, the entity-specific portion. We call our code construction the U3 identification system for uniform, universal, and unambiguous. It consists initially of a fixed length of 11 digits, which conforms to the majority of all the legacy proprietary numbering conventions uh, that will make a transformation to the new numbering convention uh, over time. The registration domain identifier, or RID portion, consists initially of a six-digit code to be administered by sovereign regulators. The remaining initial five digits are assigned by the legal entity itself in whatever sequence or manner they choose. We suggest it be sequential. The U3 identification system can be extended beyond the LEI to include all of the other requirements currently identified by U.S. regulators. Uh, next, I'd like to talk to you about what we do with all of these legal entity uh, identifiers. In the end, we need to aggregate the LEI in business entity and control groups uh, so that we can aggregate the associated cash flows and value position data across multiple financial institutions. Remember, the purpose is to see the contagion of systemic risk building up across the globe. This is yet to be determined how to do this. This is what you see here depicted, our approach uh, on how to do this. Now next, I'd like to uh, ask you some questions. Uh, we'd like to uh, poll you. The first question is, are you aware of your institution's involvement in or contribution to the development of the global LEI system? Answer yes or no. I have launched the poll question. You have approximately 10 seconds to answer. I have closed the okay. poll question. Let me share with you the results. The results are 25% said yes and 75% said no. Um quite interesting. I'm glad you're all here listening to this because it's obviously on the agenda immediately and obviously your firms have to uh, get up to speed with this. Uh, the second question, do you know what activities are underway to prepare for the implementation of the LEI system in your institution? Answer yes or no. I have launched the poll question. You have approximately 10 seconds to answer this one. I have closed the poll question. Let me share the results. We have 13% said yes and 88% said no. Well, it just reinforces uh, your need to uh, spread the word in your, uh, your own organization. Uh, next, let me uh, talk to you about exposure measurement and aggregation. We'll turn to Basil's new approach for data aggregation set to be implemented, this time we have a little time to prepare, by 2016, 
uh, that will work hand in glove with the LEI and the rest of the global ID system yet to come. The amount of time is very short when you think about the amount of systems work that has to go on to move from a new identification system to what I'm going to tell you about in the next slide on risk data aggregation and reporting. Uh, first, to understand the term risk data aggregation, it means defining, gathering, and processing risk data according to the bank's risk reporting requirements to enable the bank to measure its performance against its risk tolerance and appetite. To this end, the Financial Stability Board, in collaboration with standard setters, will develop a set of supervisory expectations to move firms, particularly the systemically important financial institutions, uh, to move their data aggregation capabilities to a level where supervisors, firms, and other users of the data, such as too big to fail financial resolution authorities, are confident that the management information and risk reports accurately capture the risks of the institution. The deadline for the largest financial institutions to meet these expectations, not to start, is the beginning of 2016. Next, I'd like to talk to you about uh, the Basel Committee's uh, risk data objectives for this initiative. What are they trying to accomplish? Well, they want to enhance the infrastructure of reporting key information particularly to the board and senior management, to use this information uh, to improve the decision-making process throughout the organization, to enhance the management of information across legal entities, while facilitating a comprehensive assessment of risk exposures at the global consolidated level. They want to reduce the probability and severity of losses resulting from data and risk management weaknesses, improve the speed at which information is available, and improve each organization's ability to manage the risk of new products and services. Quite a smorgasbord of things they want to accomplish. Next, I would like to talk to you about risk data and its key requirements. What are these requirements of this enlightened risk reporting regime? Well, here's the prescription or what they're expecting. Controls surrounding risk data should be as robust as those applicable to accounting data. Risk data should be reconciled to accounting data, as well as to a bank's sources and books of record to ensure that the risk data is accurate. A financial institution should try, strive toward a single authoritative source for risk data, risk reports should include, but not be limited to credit risk, market operational risk, liquidity risk, liquidity ratio projections, stress testing result, results, inter and intra risk concentrations, and funding positions and plans. Finally, and most importantly, it should include capital adequacy, regulatory capital, and capital ratio projections. Next, why is capital so important? Well, one of the key functions of capital is to protect depositors and other clients from the financial institution's failure. Take a look at this chart. On the right, at the lowly bottom of the chart, is the depositor. Then progressively, you can see the layers of protective capital that absorb losses as financial performance declines. We started out a number of slides ago by saying that our industry is experiencing a crisis of confidence. If investors don't have confidence in a bank's ability to identify, quantify, and aggregate its risk in a meaningful way, then performance on the left side of the slide becomes more prone to unexpected loss. That presents us with a triple whammy. If there is concern that an institution is prone to unexpected loss, Declines in performance can accelerate or go into free fall, as we saw during the financial crisis. Investors lose confidence, so they remove their capital and invest it elsewhere. And depositors get nervous about the safety of their money 
and they remove that as well. In these circumstances, capital can quickly lose its protected properties and function more like the ruler by which firms count down to failure rather than the mechanism designed to prevent it. Perhaps that explains why Basel is now switching its focus onto risk data aggregation and risk reporting in addition to their Basel III demands to enhance the quality and quantity of bank capital. Next, we want to talk about why data is so important. Need we even ask? First, risk exposures are in part the consequence of the failed or insecure interaction of manual processes and automated process with data, usually flawed data, relative to the processing of, processing of transactions and reporting of financial risk. The problem of faulty and ambiguous data creates huge operational risk as transactions cannot be processed in any reasonable, automated, and complete manner, what we refer to as straight through processing. This failure is compensated for by requiring human interaction and reconciliation procedures across all the business silos that comprise a global financial institution. The improper interaction of human and automated process on data causes risk. Streamline the process, automate the interactions, reduce the incidence of faulty data, and we can eliminate operational risk, or at least minimize it. And it's not only operational risk, the consequences of faulty data impacts data aggregation, which causes the risk calculations of the desk or department or the overall firm to be questioned, certainly with no assurance that the daily numbers are correct, and certainly with limited confidence that real-time risk management is even achievable, not without first fixing the data problem. Now, I'd like to next go to the next uh, poll question. Question three, are you surprised to find the basal rules of data aggregation so prescriptive? Answer yes or no. I have launched the poll question. You have ten, approximately 10 seconds to answer. I have closed the poll question. I will share your results. 14% said yes, 86% said no. Well, obviously you are taking uh, serious that uh, the Basel Committee uh, is taking this serious about getting data aggregated properly. Well, that's great, and I'm glad you have confidence uh, in, the, in the Basel Committee. Uh, the next question. Is your company preparing for the implementation of these data aggregation rules? Uh, answer yes, no, or don't know. I have launched the poll question. You have about 10 seconds to answer. I have closed the poll, and I will share your results. 38% said yes, 16% said no, and 46% said they didn't know. Well, again, become the evangelist in your company. Get everyone to know about this. It's important that you um, respected the fact that uh, the Basel Committee rules should be prescriptive uh, in the answer to the first question, and you're not surprised that they are. Now, the next slide uh, is actually the picture of a dog catching a frisbee. Uh, and it comes as the cover sheet to uh, a speech uh, made by a most uh, prescient observer about the current Basel regime, Andy Haldane, who is the executive director of the Bank of England's Financial Stability Council. The dog and frisbee analogy he used also, the title of his paper and speech he gave at the Federal Reserve's recent summit, summit equated uh, the uh, current risk regime as equivalent to an attempt to calculate both the flight of the frisbee and the pursuit of the dog to catch the frisbee. 
the mathematics of doing this analysis, let us say formidable in Andy's views, is as formidable as the risk, risk mathematics accepted into the Basel risk regime. His point, the dog learns by intuition to catch the frisbee. He makes the point we need to rely more on intuition and seasoned judgment than mathematics, as the dog does. Next, I'd like to talk to you about a view of Basel II and the risk models that Andy uh, shared with uh, uh, the Federal Reserve and uh, those others who attended the summit a few months ago. To quote Andy, the quest for risk sensitivity in the Basel framework, while sensible in principle, has generated problems in practice. It has spawned startling degrees at startling degrees of complexity and an over-reliance, that is the word over-reliance, on probably unreliable models. He further says, with thousands of parameters calibrated from short samples, these models are unlikely to be robust for many decades, perhaps centuries to come. It is close to impossible to tell whether results from them are prudent. A very compelling argument for simplicity, don't you think? Now, next I'd like to uh, talk about how financial firms currently manage their risk. As we all know, we have been looking at the graph on this uh, chart for a long, long time as the symbol of our overly complex, mathematically driven technique for managing risk. This is in stark contrast to the image on the previous page of the dog catching the frisbee, simply by repetitive practice and intuition, a lesson we took into our approach, I and my colleagues, to what we call risk accounting. I'd like next to talk to you about accounting systems versus risk systems. We have all come to understand the shortcoming of conventional risk management and accounting systems such as risk events that do not trigger accounting events. Flawed risk models, that is model risk, and data quality issues, we have seen the different versions of the same capital economic book with no ability to reconcile one to the other. We understand stakeholders' lack of understanding of models, of statistical theory and assumptions used versus their intuitive understanding of profit. We've seen the lack of comparability of risk quantification within and between firms leading to difficulties in budgeting risks, that is, as in risk appetite setting and monitoring, and with no ability to identify and quantify the contagion of systemic risk, thing that did us in just a few years ago. Finally, it has to be viewed as somewhat incongruous that the governing bodies that oversee the process by which banks determine the levels of capital they have, that is book capital, versus the capital they need, economic capital, follow very different philosophies. Whereas accounting bodies believe that their standards need to be highly prescriptive, banking supervisors believe, or did believe, the opposite. For example, the Financial Services Authority in the UK issued a document entitled ICAP Submissions, Suggested Format, where the first uh, line item states, quote, Firms are not required to adopt this format when asked to submit their internal capital adequacy assessment process uh, to the FS for review. They're not required to follow this format. Our research has identified these issues within current risk reporting regimes and concluded that there is a need for new, perhaps parallel techniques to our current best practice. Andy Haldane has asked for such a simplification. And perhaps now the new Bank of England governor, who will also retain his chairmanship of the FSB, will demand one as well. Next, I'd like to talk about 
uh, the misalignment in risk and accounting. We have come to understand that accounting debits are no longer a reliable proxy for exposure. It has been long mutated by derivatives. We also understand our flawed risk models and data quality issues. Our stakeholders' lack of understanding of these models, of statistical theory and assumptions made. They are in need of mapping their intuitive understanding of profit to the risk regime. As an industry, we ask a lot of our investors by expecting them to understand the difference between book capital and economic capital. One being the product of accounting, IFRS, US GAAP, and the like, that are valuation or fair value based, and the other, the product of risk modeling, that's aim is to quantify future exposure and unexpected loss. Because they are the product of two fundamentally different processes, the amount of capital produced by each uh, is not reconcilable. We and other academics believe this difference simply shouldn't exist. There should be only one version of capital. And the way to achieve that is to account for the exposures that transactions trigger rather than their inherent value. But more on that later. Uh, Next, is the answer risk accounting? From mine and my colleague's recent paper, which is available on uh, www.ssrn.com, we feel that the disclosure of an enterprise's financial condition and the concomitant determination of its capital adequacy must be a function of accounting rather than financial model. That is, it is achievable by adding risk information to the existing management information that is attached to transactions upon their registration and accounting system. In this way, a comprehensive risk management system is created that is tied to the financials of the enterprise, that is aligned with management accounting, that can produce a system of integrated risk and management reporting. Finally, that the risk appetiting uh, appetite setting process can produce measurement data and become an integral part of the enterprise's financial planning and budgeting cycle. That is what we believe of uh, Basel's risk aggregation regime and mapping it to the general ledger is all about. Next, we'd like to make uh, a brief case for risk accounting. We believe, I and my colleagues, that financial accounting needs fundamental revisions and a specialized new branch that we call risk accounting. Risk exposure measurements, or risk accounting as we call it, needs to be worked into the fabric of the risk regime if we are ever to have an effective external financial accounting and regulatory environment. Current accounting practices are focused on valuation, which is inherently a static measure of financial condition. Focused on exposures, risk accounting is inherently a dynamic measure of financial condition because it indicates how the individual balance sheet values are likely to change in response to changes in the underlying financial economic environment. We tested the implementability of the risk accounting techniques we've created through the development of pilots, prototype software, and the simulation of complex transactions. We believe that our risk accounting method improves upon the known differences of VAR and other stochastic techniques in an enterprise-wide risk context. Why? Well, because risk accounting is a direct and explicit risk exposure measurement technique that allows for consistency and comparability across firms and between firms' business units. It is an aggregatable risk measure and allows for timely and dynamic reporting of accumulating risk exposure. The system of accounting for risk is capable of dynamically linking exposure measurements with changes in causal factors providing for continual process improvement and risk mitigation by allowing the drill down to these causal factors 
and establishing measurable risk mitigation projects. It also allows for objective measures of risk appetite setting and monitoring, links operational metrics and risk metrics, and risk adjust performance reporting. The techniques we describe in our paper was first piloted at Chase Manhattan Bank in the late 90s under the sponsorship of the chief operating officer. Initially, as an operational risk management solution, at the dawn of the liberations and what was to become Basel II's introduction of a capital calculation for operational risk. Pilots have been conducted by us to test the methodology and validate output, and a research uh, collaboration was established in 2009 with the York Management School of Business and in 2012 with uh, Leeds University to update the methodology in light of the financial crisis and to extend its capability to financial risks. Next, I'd like to uh, ask her after uh, third and the fifth and sixth uh, poll questions. Five, do you believe risk management has become too complex? Answer yes or no. I have launched the poll question. You have approximately 10 seconds to answer. I have closed the poll question. I will share your results. 44% said yes, 56% said no. Um, it's pretty much evenly described. Uh, I believe the folks who might be risk managers, I believe they understand it. I believe the folks who don't, <laughs> aren't risk managers, uh, are the other half. But uh, we might have a dialogue about that in the final questions uh, that you might want to ask me. Uh, the sixth question, the last question, do you believe a method that ties accounting valuations to the riskiness of transactions can work toward simplifying risk management? Answer yes or no. I have launched the poll question. You have approximately 10 seconds to answer. I have closed the poll question. I will share your results. 69% yes, 31% said no. Well, uh, that's um, uh, a positive for the work that we've been doing over the last uh, number of years, and others, obviously. And uh, that has found its way into uh, the Basel uh, mandates for data aggregation, uh, as you, uh, you understood my presentation uh, of a few slides ago. Um, next, I'd like to uh, introduce you to uh, Premier's a Risk Data Workshop, which I and uh, another colleague of mine uh, are privileged uh, to be uh, uh, providing in a three-day workshop from March 26 to 28 in New York City. We will explore these and related issues that we just discussed in depth. Uh, next, the course outline uh, is shown here day by day. <clears throat> it's an intensive course. It'll cover in depth that which I was just able to cover on the surface in this webinar. Uh, we have it laid out over the three days in, uh, in the two separate sessions in each uh, morning and afternoon session over the three days. Uh, you will. Um, be delighted to know that uh, I and my partner will be uh, up close and uh, in your face for those three days. Maybe we'll have fun. Perhaps we'll be intense at times. We'll have good dialogue, and I invite you all to, uh, to come. We have quite a number of people that have already uh, signed up for the event, and uh, we'll look forward to perhaps um, some of you who are on this call to do the same. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, refer you to the next slide, which basically is um, me in my full glory with my picture and my uh, smaller bio. And then the next slide 
uh, which is my colleague, uh, Peter Hughes, and his uh, um, bio, somewhat shortened. Uh, Peter uh, has uh, been uh, a risk manager and a country manager at uh, J.P. Morgan Chase for quite a number of years and its predecessor firm, uh, Chase Manhattan Bank. And uh, he runs our uh, business out of the UK. Um, I would like to conclude uh, that uh, the starting point for risk adjusting uh, the financial system is the global identification system, specifically the LEI initiative to begin in 2013, and the Basel Committee risk aggregation mandate to be enforced beginning in 2016. We, we need to start now. We've attempted uh, in this webinar to describe uh, each of those uh, prescriptions for change and a lot more detail on these and risk account accounting will be focused on in the three-day training event uh, later this month. Now, taken together, uh, they will allow for data transparency, risk aggregation of position and cash flow data. It will lower the tolerance for losses give regulators seeing ability to finally implement its regulatory oversight mandate, reduce huge duplicated infrastructure, see triggers of systemic risk, and finally permit the long voice mantra of straight through processing for improving the industry's efficiency and lowering its cost. Uh, next, I turn it over uh, to our moderator, who will uh, prompt you to ask me questions. I thank you for allowing me uh, to present our thinking. Alan, thank you for for your presentation today. I think I think uh, everybody had uh, a lot to learn from this. Uh, and we have quite a few questions from, from our audience. And uh, I would like to start uh, to, to kick it off by going back to the Lehman case and uh, ask you if you can talk a little bit more about um, how long it, it took us to, to identify the um, Lehman's exposure to the LEIs. Uh, if I understand the question, it was how long did it take us to get to understand that the legal entity identifier was a key to solving risk management problems, and if that's the question. Uh, it took yes, about 30 years. Correct. It took 30 years and multiple attempts to try and do what now is being pushed down from the top, the G20, for us to do. When I say 30 years, I literally date it to the uh, 1987 market crash in the United States, which had repercussions throughout the world. And the uh, attempt then to organize a study group uh, led by then Chairman John Reed to understand the causes of the problem and the long-term cures. It was at that point in time uh, around the whole idea of what went wrong and how to improve it that the study produced uh, the idea of uh, getting a standard golden copy of referential data, meaning the identities of financial market participants, the products they trade, and all of the data elements associated with those uh, business entities and their products. It was believed and still is that that is common to all and should be given out as non-proprietary to everyone as the common denominator baseline for supporting all the other business applications to come in the financial industry. So it took uh, five different attempts by various organizations to fail for the Financial Stability Board to take it on after the financial crisis uh, and to understand what they found in the Lehman basement of needing to fix the plumbing is an endemic problem and that uh, it's the first step on the road to risk adjusting the financial system. I'm, I'm glad you, I'm glad you ended with that uh, because our, our next question is uh, how many uh, LEIs does a complex bank usually have, and uh, in your opinion, is the current LEI structure a good one? Okay, uh, I could give you some numbers that are accurate. 
Uh, Goldman Sachs has 10,000 legal entities under its umbrella. Uh, Bank of America has 4,000. Deutsche Bank has 6,000. Morgan Stanley has 6,000. On and on and on and on and on. A lot. A lot. Uh, the question about how the legal entity identifier project is proceeding, uh, I, I happen to be an advisor on the project, one of many. And so I have some intimate knowledge of it. Uh, and um, it's uh, proceeding as best you can expect. And that's a positive. I don't mean to be coy. Given that we have now 60 regulatory organizations spread out over maybe 40 different countries buying in to the concept of pushing through in their own jurisdictions the mandate, the requirement, the cajoling of financial institutions and financial market participants to get uh, a legal entity identifier by registering their information in the local uh, operating units that will run their local uh, registries. It is quite an accomplishment to get so many people, so many disparate regulatory regimes, so many countries to sign on to this uh, that we have to give a thumbs up for this effort. Now, the devil is always in the detail. And uh, I don't want to leave you hanging here, but I can't go into all the detail of what the issues are. But I can give you a clue that, in our opinion, the devil is in the construction of the code itself to allow for uh, the ability to aggregate all of these multiple LEIs into one unit to solve the Lehman uh, problem and to be able to aggregate these, uh, these legal entities that are going to be registered across multiple local operating units in any uh, reasonable time frame in order for it to work for analysis uh, of internal needs as well as systemic risk needs. Uh, the other thing is the relationships that each entity has with the other. And that is something that is being focused on as we speak. And it has to do initially with uh, uh, dealing with uh, the way in which uh, these business entities are consolidated for accounting and materiality attestation purposes. Uh, that is our current focus. And of course, we have to move out of that uh, uh, organizational form for legal entities into credit uh, aggregation for credit limits, for example, and for aggregation for counterparty risks, for example. So there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, and uh, we'll be standing up a board of directors shortly, within weeks perhaps. And those of you who uh, care to nominate people, uh, you'll be uh, pinged uh, in, a, in a public way to do so. And we're looking to get the uh, most prominent, most capable people to lead this effort uh, into the future. Uh, thanks, Alan. And you, you mentioned uh, the different uh, regu regulatory regimes. Uh, can these projects ever come to function without any regulatory compulsion? Is this one of the major hurdles that, that we're facing? Well, I've made my voice heard loud and clear that it can never happen without regulatory compulsion. And the reason I say that is because we've tried and failed. I've personally tried and organized the financial community globally to do this. And in the end, uh, it, it, it was uh, disbanded in favor of, of the competitive forces uh, and the nature of competition in the financial industry. Even the standards bodies are competitive with each other. And so unless we have regulatory compulsion, this will never work. I think we have it. Thank you. That's and uh, how does a structure with, uh, with so many LEIs uh, solve the problem related to, to risk aggregation? Um, with how? Well, uh, the first thing is we do have so many LEIs. I mean, that's the reality. Goldman Sachs has 10,000 business entities. I mean, we can't, we can't bypass that. Why they do it? SDVs, trusts a whole bunch of things, securitized products, you know, a whole bunch of things. Um, so that's a given. So what we have to do is be smart about how to aggregate these. 
And the Global Legal Entity Identification System is attempting to be smart about how to aggregate these. We have presented our proposal on how to do this. Others have different ideas on how to do this. And hopefully, in, in, in the court of public opinion and thoughtful opinion, based upon people like yourself who are on this webinar, we will debate the issue in, in the rigorous way we need to and come to a non-political, non-forced uh, decision to the common, lowest common denominator and solve the problem at the highest level of uh, intellect, systems design, and uh, an understanding that what we do now is the first step on what has to be fit for purpose for all our aspirations for the future. Well, thank you very much, uh, Alan, and uh, thank you for today's presentation. Um, those, uh, those are all the, the questions that we had from the audience uh, so far. So with, uh, with that, um, I'm going to turn it back to Anne. Thanks, Andy. <clears throat> thank you, Alan, for sharing your expertise, and thank you to all that have joined us today. Just a couple of things I need to mention. Um, the go-to webinar link that I sent you that you use to access this webinar will become your recording link in the next 48 hours. Usually it's in a couple hours, but give me up to 48 hours to get that done. Um, also, make sure that you check out the details for the three-day course, three course that's being led by Alan and Peter. Um, by going to Premia's website at www.prmia.org. You can click on the training tab. You can also check out um, more upcoming thought leadership webinars at the same www.premia.org um, and check out what, go to webinars under the training tab. And you can check out becoming a sustaining membership under our website. Uh, thank you for joining this webinar.